was gonna ask, what's the weather like? Cause it's here. Oh, I got it. I got almost too much sun yesterday. All right. Well, uh, today I'm super excited to have Karen Larson on, and I was very fortunate to have you as my broadcasting partner, my first ever, and hopefully more to come, uh, Olympic experiences as a commentator or on-air analyst, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, and, and for, for people, people that, that are unaware, unaware if they, they live, live under a rock. Uh, your resume kind of like fills a page. So I'll look at my notes to mention some of the things, but uh, a world champion in what they used to call synchronized swimming, I think they now call artistic swimming. Right, got it. Yeah. So right. 86 world champion, uh, Olympic team member in 88, I believe. Right. <clears throat> and then you got the best sports caster in Vancouver, the Leo Award in 1999, 2001 BC Swimming Hall of Fame, 2019 Coquitlam Hall of Fame, 2021 BC Sports Hall of Fame. Um, your news, uh, news reporter and sports reporter for CBC. Um, you've been covering, I don't know, is it nine Olympics that you've done now? Eight, nine? Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah it's up there. <laughs> I think it's 10, 11. There's some Paralympics in there as well. So uh, yeah, right. Few. yeah. Right. And then um, you also got to uh, cover your sister winning Olympic silver medal in 96 in Atlanta. So, uh, and I think that was with Steve Armitage, if I'm correct. That, that yeah, was that's, yes, yes, that was one of my very first sort of, that was my very first Olympics as a broadcaster. So that was, it was fantastic and also very weird, right? Right. And yeah. for, for people that might not immediately recognize the name Steve Armitage, look him up. And if you hear his voice, you will immediately recognize it. It's like one of the voices of Canadian sports, um, just an absolute iconic voice let alone like what he's covered like you hear his voice and you just think sports broadcasting and then what he's got to cover is is pretty incredible yeah. and you're speaking from personal experience on that little anecdote aren't you Josh? right yeah. yeah like growing up hearing him you know you turn on hockey you don't really think about it and then you just hear that voice and then meeting him in person uh i was very fortunate to be introduced to him and uh, by yourself and then just hearing that voice in person is like it's it's special yeah. And, and the one thing that I really loved is with any job, no matter how much you love it, no matter what the job is, um, sometimes any work can sort of wear you down and people can lose some of their passion for it or whatever, I guess. And one thing that was awesome to me was when we were there, the women's, I don't remember what number it was, sixes or eights in rowing. Oh, the women's eights, yeah. The women's eights when they won the in gold Tokyo. medal. Yeah. And it wasn't necessarily an expected result. And I was just sitting in the prepping area when Steve came out and he was glowing. Like he was yeah. so excited to have got to call that gold medal for Canada. And it was, it was so nice to see like after however many games he's called that, mm -hmm. that he was so excited to call that Olympic gold medal. It was pretty awesome to see that that passion like you know still there yeah I'm, I'm always impressed by uh sportscasters who do the do the big time which is hockey night in canada and do that for a number of years but also come to olympic sport where you and i grew up and mm -hmm. have an equal amount of excitement and passion for olympic sport as well like you know hockey's the big show in in, in this uh country when it comes to broadcasting right but a guy like steve when he he brings that it just makes i don't know it's what it deserves right the big time treatment the big time voice the big time guy right yeah totally awesome the other one i i'm i swear i'm terrible whenever i start speaking to someone i forget the name that i'm looking <laughs> for but um baseball commentator for the toronto blue jays Oh, Dan uh, Schulman. Dan like Schulman. Basketball, yes. Right, yeah. yeah. Loves basketball. For people yeah. that don't know, he, like, loves, loves basketball. But he's, like, the voice of baseball for everyone, you know? Yeah. Like, it doesn't matter if you turn on Fox or ESPN. I swear, I just hear him all the time. And he has another one of those just incredible voices and yeah. and also is, like, such a genuinely nice person. Yeah. Um, just loves sports, loves talking basketball. and Yeah, yeah. You know, those guys with the great pipes the really good instrument i mean th th those are two of our country's best sports broadcasters but they sort of bring a gravitas to the whole thing as well right you know, it's instantly legitimate uh as soon as they open their own, their mouth right, right. Yeah, yeah it's, it's yeah it's it's incredible it's and the and then the thing that's sort of amazing about getting to broadcast or report is that it's a much longer career than your athletic career as as you're obviously well aware is your our athletic careers are so brief and the impact that you have compared to a coaching career or a broadcasting career, which can be, which can be pushed for so long, because obviously your voice can, can last a long, 
lot longer than your physical capabilities at the highest level. Yeah, so that's interesting. I mean, but that's that's hard for people getting out of sport though too. I, I know it was very difficult for me to make make that transition because mm-hmm. you you're career in sport is relatively short and extremely intense yeah pretty much takes up all your time and brain power if you're competing uh, internationally and then and then it's like it's over and it's like wow what right now right if, you, if you're not a good planner like i wasn't this episode right. is brought to you by barren ground coffee started in 2017 in Yellowknife, they focus on delicious blends of coffee from all over the world and now ship anywhere in canada They support numerous events and causes and not only deliver a great product, but prioritize staff health and well-being. Go out and get some of their coffee if you haven't already. But I think uh, the more and more people that I speak to um, in judo, we have that vibe. So in judo, there's all these judoka and then sometimes they move in, but it feels like this void to fill. So when you grow up, when you grow up chasing high performance in a sport, you're often, um, isolated to the sport and your yes. which isn't bad like you just you get to know that community so well and you get really strong ties but it's sometimes hard to have a reference of the of the lens of the rest of the world of other sports mm-hmm. and the more that I speak to other people like I had a recent, recent conversation. conversation with Paul Jordan who oh, yeah. is like the greatest Canadian volleyball player ever and was the best volleyball player in the world also just a genuinely great guy same thing he said that his his wife even told him that for years after he was he was like a shell just you feel so lost and like when when your when your self-worth is so connected to what you're trying to achieve that when that ends it's very hard to sort of find your place again because your every aspect of you is connected to that what people know me as what people know me as outside of the sport that's what I am and so it feels like life is sort of getting reset like I can imagine um, people when they retire from the regular jobs you know when they're later in life where they might feel that way but it's it's weird because you might be 25 or you might be 30 or you might be 35 like you're so young and you feel totally lost yeah yeah I think that's very true and I, I think too even though you can be mentally aware that that's a change that's coming to actually go through it is is very different and, mm-hmm. and when you live in sport and you, you live in I mean I grew up in a smallish sport right synchronized swimming and swimming and and I, I think judo is fairly there's probably two degrees of separation between everyone in the judo community across Canada right so you live in this sort of world where you have a shorthand uh, because everyone knows what you're talking about you're all sort of uh, aware of the same things it's it's a bit I don't know is it clubby the right word right. Uh, and then and then to venture outside of that where you don't have all those reference points and that level of expertise can be very intimidating to, right. you know to, to change your you know and and I, I remember thinking when I left sport and I uh, was still trying to finish university um, you know okay I'll just bring the same I'll just you know spend the same amount of hours in school or on my schoolwork as I was on my sport uh, which you know it's, it was a good idea a good thought but was very hard to do actually yeah because it's not it's not that thing it's not the thing that's motivating it's not that thing that you're passionate about it's not that thing where you have this you know massive goal at the end uh, that you're working towards and and all the people around you are also supporting you as well or yeah right right Right. yeah 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 it's a funny thing though the one thing to that like I think also if we if we focused on some of those other aspects, like we did our sport, that might be a little crazy making as well. Like the the connection to high performance sport and health is an interesting one to me. I'm I'm definitely not saying people shouldn't do it. I definitely believe it's not for everyone. And I don't think it's necessarily a healthy lifestyle. So Mm -hmm. the fact that at some point it ends is probably better for people, especially mentally, because the amount of pressure that you put on yourself, the lack of Mm -hmm. sleep you get because you're obsessing over the smallest detail and how you can get better probably yeah. isn't something that's sustainable throughout your whole life. So finding some kind of balance in the transition after is probably important. But the, the one thing that's really powerful that I find that's a commonplace now, obviously there's exceptions to every rule, but many, many, many people that I know that have um, legitimately made a hard push to become um, high performance athletes, whether they reached all of their goals or some of their goals or not as many of the goals as they like, when that was sustained for a number of years, their transition while difficult at times is often quite successful. Like the amount of people that are highly successful in terms of reporting or building a club or coaching or like that, 
that innate work ethic that you've honed for so many years seems to transition very well to when they do find their next passion. It might mm -hmm. not be sport or it might be sport in a different way, but that often translates to very successful careers, I find. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think of it sometimes, um, and, and I, I'm very critical of myself I, I, <laughs> in, in uh, doing stories and writing and, and, and reporting and, and, and doing my job, but just that sense of, I don't know how, how think of a move, Josh, that you had to do a thousand, 10,000 times before you got it right. Like in synchronized swimming, it's they're so precision oriented. And so like nothing was ever perfect ever. You know, you, mm -hmm. you're just sort of striving for this ideal that you could just never get to. Um, and, you know, a lot of repetition and a lot of, a lot of just trying to hone even the, the finest little, I don't know, angle or mm -hmm. wh whatever it was at the time. And I think that was actually a bit detrimental for me when I moved into what I call my career. Um, it just like really, really should have been a little bit easier on myself. And, uh, you right. know, uh, I, and, yeah, for my own mental health too, just understanding, you know, that you're not going to be really good right away right like mm -hmm. you need to you need to sort of develop those skills the way you have uh, other maybe the, the skills you did during your sport i i don't know i, I don't know how that was for you uh, i i moved out of my sport i mm -hmm. made a conscious effort even though i did do some coaching to to step away and that was probably uh, a wise decision and yet still work in the you know in the sector of sport right right yeah, yeah the I wonder sometimes if, um, because it's such a common trait, like the term perfectionist, like people wanting mm -hmm. things to be perfect, doesn't mean that you actually perfect everything. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah so that, that idea that what you're chasing being a perfectionist, I think, I don't know if it's that trait is created by your, by your, um, ambition and your motivation and your passion for a sport, or if it's that so many people that are perfectionists are of the personality trait to want to chase high performance because of that. Yeah. Like, I don't know if it's a chicken in the egg situation because it's like, you know, it's so common that you talk to those people and they're like, that personality is that they're perfectionists. Maybe that's why they chase that. And maybe that's the, the challenge that you're trying to overcome all the time is to, to not be so brutally hard on yourself. It could be that that's our personality trait and that's what drove us in that direction. Mm -hmm. Or it could have created it as, as or who knows, maybe some combination or the other, but it's, it is such a common thing. Like I'm that way. It's like, you do something and then, uh, you're like, it's, it's not perfect. So then you're like, should I even do it at all? <laughs> like, is it even worth my effort at all? Should I just scrap it and throw oh, it away? Yeah. Oh. Uh, that's a horrible little spiral to get into. <laughs> right. It's, terrible. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's why I, I find little quotes or, or quirks or whatever, or things that I read that I try to hold on to, to give me some of that balance. I believe it's the the person that started uh, LinkedIn, he said, if you're not embarrassed by the first, by the first attempt at doing something, then you started too late. Mm -hmm. so, oh, interesting. Yeah. So huh. I sort of like the idea of that because then yeah. I can accept, I can accept myself screwing up or not doing something perfectly. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's good. We all have to be a little bit kinder uh, with ourselves, I think. Right. right. It's an it's insane an standard that you cannot live up to. So you're guaranteed to yeah. fail. And then you're yeah. dealing with this failure, which as a perfectionist, you never want the end, you know, it just, yeah. it just plays in itself. Like, yeah, but that's where, that's where sport is so good, actually, because I, I wouldn't have ever said this when I was in my 20s. So I left sport when I was 25. Um, but that you are in this little crucible where you can be sort of that obsessive about, you know, something and, and really push yourself and strive for it because it is as important as it is when you're in it it's just sport ultimately right yeah. like and if you you know if you if you realize that you have a finite career especially in a small sport where you're never going to make any money you know you know it's it's a sport career it's not a money making career mm -hmm. um you, you know you you can sort of keep your sanity i think ultimately just by by recognizing that you know you you you, you fail you succeed within the walls of that sport mm -hmm. right and, right. and there are walls, which are kind of nice, actually, uh, I think sometimes think of think of it that way. Right. right. Um, 
to that one point that you just made, I didn't know. I didn't know till now. So I stopped competing when I was around 23, 24, and mm -hmm. you stopped at 25 with an mm -hmm. extensive career at 25. So do you ever look back because as a world champion and an Olympic athlete might have been a little different. I think the world of sport is getting a better understanding that um, your athletic career doesn't have to, you know, you don't have to be LeBron James at 19 to be successful, like careers start much later. You look at guys like Jose Bautista that became everyday players at 27 and at 29 are league MVPs. So do you ever, not necessarily with regret, but wonder about how things could have been different because 25 is pretty young, especially at the level of success you had to, to stop in the sport. Two things. I think sport and Olympic sport, when I uh, was leaving, was way different than it was now. It, it, you just, I, I just was the poor athlete for a long time. Um, mm -hmm. Even though uh, I had funding, uh, I was living away from home. Um, you know, just enough uh, carding money uh, to sort of pay my bills, have a car. And I worked as a waitress in a, in a bar to fund my swimming career. Cause it, you know, 24, 25 years old, you don't want your, you know, the bank of mom and dad still having to pay for everything, um, mm -hmm. right? And when I left uh, and I had just turned 25, I felt so old, Josh, right. at 25, I felt so old. Uh, and people, you know, it was very rare for anyone to stay in a sport past there because, it was more of an, it was more amateur than it is now. Like you just, you didn't have sponsors. You, you, there weren't money-making opportunities. There, you know, you, you no, God, the, the fact that women are, you know, fighting for childcare and uh, maternity leave in sport just sort of blows my mind because I don't think I knew any athletes who were mothers during their sporting career. Whereas now there are quite a few and fathers as well. Right. So they're, they're able to have it as a true career. Now it's not going to last forever, obviously, but there's there's more of a continuum you don't sort of just drop off the edge and it's over um for that so yeah i, I think it's interesting uh 25 felt really old my husband who was a high performance swimmer on the national swim team he quit at age 22 and he felt old at 22 he says right. so right. uh that's that's what it was like in the 80s it was a little bit different 35 years ago than it is now right but, right, but uh, i mean to that to that point, I'll say the same thing as I stopped competing at around 23. And the exact same thing is I felt old. I felt yeah. my body was, I had a couple injuries in the last, my last year and a half of judo, I had like thumb surgery and I had a number of surgeries and injuries. And, and I was like, oh my gosh, I feel so old. This is a sign that I'm so old. I can't keep doing it. It's insane. Um, it, it didn't, it didn't hurt the fact that I was at that point dramatically under what my own mental projection of where I would be is. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, you you have all those injuries and you just think, oh, my God, my body's breaking down. And now I think of a 23 year old as such a child. I don't mean that in a disrespectful way. Yeah. But it's like There is so much more to life at that stage. Yeah. when I felt like, oh, my God, I'm so old. And I always chuckle when people refer to athletes preparing for an Olympics for four years. And I always chuckle at that because as an athlete, like I was allowed on the mats at three and a half. I was at the dojo before that because my brothers did judo, but at three and a half, I was allowed on the mats. So I stopped at 23. So if say in an alternate universe, I qualified for the Olympics, that would have been 20 years of judo before that. So that's the other part is like when people are in a high performance level competing nationally or internationally, they've often done it easily for a decade. It's not a quad that you got ready for maybe in some way, but it, these are lifetime um, achievements or lifetime, lifetime work, you know, to get to that point. So when feeling old at that age is like, yeah, because for the last 15 years, I've been doing this six days a week and yeah. weight training and working. So. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you feel old and then you come out, it's, I moved back from Calgary to Vancouver where I grew up and uh, you know, you reconnect with some friends from high school and, and, they've bought houses, they're married, they've had, children, you know, they've really sort of established themselves and you, and you have a Toyota to sell to your name and, and that's right. about it. And that's right. breaking down too. Right. right. <laughs> and you haven't finished university. Right. So, yeah. You know. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. yeah. And it, and it's a, it's also an interesting thing to think about it that way, like where your priorities lie, you know, cause it is, yeah. it's, it's very different. Like when you're going that way, it, contrary to popular belief, most athletes are not thinking about paychecks. They're thinking about competing at the highest level and wanting to have a chance to compete against the best. They're not thinking this is going to get me a Bentley. 
because that would be insane yeah. to think yeah. that. Yeah. No, I think most of them are thinking, you know, how can I, I, I support myself, uh, live comfortably, maybe, yeah, save for the future. Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I, it's so different in different sports. So you think of someone like Andre de Grasse, who has lots of sports, you know, it's, it's sort of the, the big timers in the mm -hmm. Canadian Olympic sports scene. Um, I, I, I think they, they do. Okay. Mm -hmm. But you know, let me tell you all those, the, the, those eight women who won the gold medal in rowing, um, I'm sure they all have day jobs or right. <laughs> right? like right. it's, a, it's just what your sport, uh, the, the profile of your sport, um, allows for. Yeah. But yeah but the number of athletes that get that, even if they come from a, a sporting world where there is that much money, like you look at American football, how many people play division one in the NFL? I don't know. It's huge numbers yeah. of that. How many actually make the NFL yeah. of that who lasts more than three years, Yeah, which is the average length of a, of a player right. in the NFL. So yeah. the amount of people that get these rags to riches financially in sport, yeah. even in the big time sports is a very rare, like, yeah. like if you look at um, amateur baseball players, they're some of the least paid workers on the uh -huh. planet. Oh, for like sure. Some of the most underpaid people on the planet Earth is like single A baseball players. Yeah. So, yeah, there is definitely, you know, the Kevin Gosmans who get over $100 million contracts. But there's a yeah. lot of people that are literally living at less than minimum wage salaries is what they're yeah. making. It's like, yeah, yeah, it's pretty wild. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. No, I think about the CFL football players uh, right. that way sometimes who uh, are some of the best at their sport in the world mm -hmm. you know playing in i guess what is the second tier league and uh wow like the the difference between playing the cfl and the money you make there versus playing in the nfl and the money you make there uh same game different countries obviously different profiles um but it's it's yeah it's a razor thin edge i think sometimes to get over um yeah over the hump it's, you also, know, it, it's also amazing how that sport changed so much i think it was like 1991 where rocket ishmael was drafted yeah. to the cfl and showed oh, yeah. the cfl over the nfl because they were going to pay yeah. him more that was well, like 91 yeah so who was it it was bruce mcnall it was gretzky and it was john candy right this is when they had bought the toronto argos back then and this yeah. was as much a publicity play as it was i mean rocket ishmael was a legit fantastic player it's kind of what you see what's the name of the new golf league in the saudi backed you know dustin johnson going to to this even down the PGA, pga events and for right. 125 million dollars to go play on this saudi back tour tour i mean you know a curse on just uh dustin johnson but like that's that's how it, that's what the cfl was trying to do back when it brought in uh uh, Rocket Ishmael, right? Right, and you <laughs> could say the that MLS that. followed that same thing. They have a really interesting mm. system where they allow so many players that are outside of the salary cap structure, and you brought yeah. in people like David Beckham. Yeah, but they um, always get the old guys, right? They don't get guys right. at their prime. They get, right. the, they get the names right. afterwards when they're in the sunset of their career. Right, right, right. That's true. But yeah. they, they have such weight to their name. Like, I read a report that supposedly um, Lionel Messi is looking at going to the MLS when his contract ends in France. Now yeah. he's not the Lionel or Lionel Messi that he was a couple of years ago, but this yeah. guy's still um, pretty top tier. Like that's yeah. that's a pretty wild name to think that they're bringing them there. And and I think maybe them being able to stick to that game plan for so long has slowly started to bring in a little more talent at a little bit younger age for the for MLS. That it's yeah. that it's sort of a different um, world well, now. So I, I think I got this right because uh, when Thierry Henry went to did he go to New, New York. York Red Bull? Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but he wouldn't play in stadiums that had artificial turf. So it was a big deal when New York Red Bull was coming to Vancouver, Vancouver, because yeah. uh, Thierry Henry was going to play, and then he refused to play because uh, BC Play Stadium has terrible turf. So I said, I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm just you right. know, remembering that story. There was right. quite a bit of excitement, even though again, a guy in a sunset of his career, and then he <laughs> comes down and is like, no, I'm not playing on that concrete. Right. And why would he? It's, it's right. so damaged. At that, that age too. Yeah. Oh. Ouch. And after my knees hurt just had. thinking about it. Yeah. Yeah. Like I think he won the World Cup with France. He's like an all timer, yeah. like great yeah. player. Yeah. 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 Um, I guess to the more niche sport of synchronized swimming, what mm -hmm. brought you to that? Of I don't mean that it, it's just it as a person that never got involved, it also as a person that was always scared I was gonna drown when I get into the <laughs> pool. I can yeah. tread water, but you know, um yeah. it's just like it's such a niche sport. It also comes across to me as a person that 
can swim, but not yeah. swim, swim. Um, so physically demanding to be yeah. able to perform in that. Yeah, so it's a pretty uh, straight line. I have three sisters. Um, my parents are immigrants from Europe. So my dad's from Denmark. My mom's from Holland. Uh, both of them very sports minded. My dad was a very good athlete, um, very good rower in Denmark. Uh, you know, comes to Canada in his young twenties. Has four daughters. Uh, you know, he just he just wanted a soccer player. Ends up having four girls. And I'm I'm 58 now. When I was growing up, there was no girls teams for anything. If you you know were sports minded. Uh, and wanted to be competitive. It was swimming, I think, and maybe some gymnastics. So um, my parents ended up joining the YMYWCA in Westminster. We were enrolled in all the programs and uh, swimming was one of them. And uh, because there was a YWCA there, synchronized swimming um, background in Canada is a lot through the YWCA programs across the country. And so yeah, we just like joined all the things. And that was one of the things I joined and uh, I ended up having a lot of friends in it. And it's my friends that kept me in and just sort of went back every year and, and got pretty good at it. Yeah, it's it's funny how the it, same thing, like coming from a, um, a judo background, which obviously is very niche. And you think of the 1980s, if you're going to do a martial art, it wouldn't be judo, it'd probably be the karate kid. Yeah. The karate. Um, yeah. But I was in a hometown of 2,700 people. And this guy started working at the Bruce Nuclear Power Station. He had a black belt in judo. So he started teaching at the town hall. Yeah. And my oldest brother, who was quite athletic and troublesome in a sense, not that he was bad, but he had a lot of energy at five and six. So he'd get in, you know, he'd try to climb onto the garage roof, like weird things like that. So my parents yeah. just put him in every sport that they could yeah, so, to get rid of some of this energy. And what, um, for people that don't know about judo, judo is a grappling sport. So wrestling, there's no striking, but lots of wrestling, throwing things like that. Well, that's natural to lots of kids to enjoy that. So he takes to mm -hmm. it, loves it. My mom has five kids, so she would just bring us all to the dojo. So every day I see people wrestling and laughing. And so I'm like, oh, I have to, I have yeah, to do this. Exactly. So, Plus your older brother's in it and every right, younger yeah, my kid idols, wants to do right? what, yeah, of course. Yeah, so, so I'm like, like I, I have, have to do what, what they're, they're doing. doing so, so, then, then, um, so I naturally go to it. But yeah, it's, it's sort of funny how, how you find those different niches. There wasn't necessarily anything. I don't know. That, there wasn't no dojo within an hour of us. I, yeah, I was going to say free babysitting for your mom. It wasn't free, but it was a break for the parents, right? Right. I'm pretty sure right. that was it for my mom as well. Yeah. Yeah. yeah she, she wasn't, wasn't going to pay daycare or some yeah. babysitter to leave me at home when she went to the dojo. So I just came. Yeah. Yeah. So I started coming from like birth to the dojo. Yeah. And so uh, when, when did it, it spark in you that this was something that you were either good at or you really loved or you... Oh, wait, I'm doing the interviewing now. Anyway. No, well, I mean, uh, for my own ego, it's sort of nice to hear the, hear yeah. the question. It's funny because yours probably, it's been so, it's been so long that you've been doing the job of interviewing people that it's probably easy to fall into that yeah. um, it's a little... trap, I'll say. But but because yeah. I think it's sort of funny is, yeah, so when I was little, I started going every day and then I would go when there was judo days. And what I remember uh, really, and my dad actually reminded me of this, who my dad, who doesn't remember my birthday or how old I am, but remembers this story is I was about five and a half or six. I was horribly sick. I'd never missed a single judo class and I was really sick. So I fall asleep before judo starts. My family goes to the dojo. My sister, my oldest sister stays home with me because I'm so sick. And I wake up while they're still at the dojo and had a meltdown. <laughs> how can you go without me? Like, I've never yes. missed a class in my life. Like, how yeah. can they leave me here? And I think, and I remember that still, which is kind of wild, but it's like, I was so in love with the idea of judo um, that, yeah, it was just, I, I couldn't believe it. And because I started and I was at the dojo so young, I honestly don't remember before. It's like asking someone when they learned wow. how to walk. I've just always done it. This is just like my life. So it's, yeah, yeah. So it's sort of a funny thing that way. So, um, yeah, I guess the, the other, the other thing I was interested in is looking back at your career athletically is if you were to, there's so much that's changed in, in so long, but I also think we get in the mindset that whatever we're doing now is the best which isn't necessarily true. Like we always think everything we do now is so evolved. Oh, we know so much more now. We're, we understand physiology or, or sports so much better. But when you look at, um, they, they, I saw a commercial or a YouTube video or something 
where they had the gentleman that won the, he was an American Olympic champion in the 100 meter. And they had Andre de Grasse run the race and the comparables on a dirt track with different shoes. And Andre's not used oh, to that I've, equipment, but I've seen that. Yeah. That's an interesting show, right? I think that there's a whole series of, of athletes then and now kind of, right. Yeah. It, 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 we, we love to think that we're the most evolved we've ever been. So we yeah. must be doing stuff better now. I yeah. don't think that's necessarily true at all, but I guess um, from your career, like if you could go back, not again, not from a place of regret, but if you're like, there's something that I found later at some point in my life that if I could go back and do that, younger or at a different mm -hmm. time or focus on that more do you have anything mm -hmm. like that that you um I, I don't think so uh like i i was i became a good athlete out of sheer bloody mindedness and hard work i have to say that i'm not the most talented person i barely made the olympic team and i went as an alternate and in, in 1988 um you know i was in the top tier in canada but never except for in a team event you know of the best there was and, and i think i probably maxed out my my abilities just uh like i say through sort of sheer bloody mindedness which is which is a really good trait to have i think mm -hmm. in life and a lot of things and not just in sport although for other people around you it can be hard to, <laughs> to deal with right um, things things are different now i i think if there's one thing i would do different is i would probably stand up for myself and the athletes i was with more and more it's, it's something i think about a lot as a reporter um what, reading and covering some of these stories that are taking place in sport now where you're you know it's quite quite a scene in canada in terms of athletes speaking out about perceived abuses uh in their high performance careers right in gymnastics mm -hmm. Artistic swimming is also one where this has happened. Uh, bobsled recently, I'm trying to think of them all. Um, you know, and there, there are some things about sport that are a high performance sport, elite sport, there are, that are in, inherently in, unhealthy. Um, and Canada is probably better than a lot of countries too, in terms of, of what we accept. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think athletes need to be listened to more and treated more like athletes and not a, 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 like like adults and and a, as peers and experts within their own sport because it's themselves than they have been and certainly I'm not saying anything about my my past or I, ha I had great coaches great support and everything but it is it is a milieu at the top and when you're pushing really hard that is it's can be mentally and physically really unhealthy right you really mm -hmm. really and and there i think there are some points where i probably should have stepped back i probably shouldn't have trained i probably shouldn't have you know i probably should have gone to a doctor i probably should have done a, a lot of things i think i just would have taken better care of my own health mental and physical um had i right. it all to do over again right yeah and the I think there's so many reasons why that becomes the cultural norm. Yeah. And I don't think that it necessarily even became all the cultural norm out of a, like, what's the word I'm looking for on purpose, you know, that it's sort of accidentally, it's sort of an accidental coincidence mm -hmm. in some degree. You have athletes that are so desperate to succeed. Again, like we said before, it's so connected to their worth that they're you become so worried that one bad performance or one bad day or one mispractice is yeah. going to mean the end of your career. And you so desperately want this goal yeah. Yeah. or multiple yeah. goals that you have. So that puts people in these positions. And I think the one area where the evolution of sport has gotten a lot better is for instance, in the NCCP coaching, there's a lot more about uh, so much of it isn't about the technical aspect. It's about training people on what's appropriate as a coach, because yeah. So many of us have seen so many things that were inappropriate through our lives. So training people on what is appropriate behavior, how to treat people yeah. appropriately in that yeah. position. And I guess the other area is that the coaching position used to be such a position of power. It used to be such a position of only what the coach says goes. They had Why so much power. Used to. Is that not the... the it's not, it's not the case now. Yeah. But I think you have some very high profile cases where it's changed careers not mm -hmm. to throw Mike Babcock under the bus. Sure. Yeah. Things like that happen. Yeah. And that's probably a wake up call. Like, Oh, like what he did to one particular athlete mm -hmm. um, wasn't 
a physical aggression or, or anything like that. But what he did was so horrific as a coach and just destroying the whole position of trust in a relationship, yeah. which is yeah. what the coach athlete relationship is all about. Um, so it definitely still occurs. I think there's definitely some cultural issues, but I think that it is at least leaning towards growth in that, in that area that, that this isn't how we should treat athletes, that you need to treat them better, that it needs to be culturally normal. And then you have things like, um, you know, like you have safe sport and, and these, these become like a mandatory part of all sporting organizations that they have a way to contact people outside of the organization to, to, yeah. to talk about these things that have happened. And then the athletes that have had so many of these horrific things occur to them that they are brave enough, which is fantastic for everyone. Like all of us get the benefit of that, whether that's yeah. parents or former athletes or whatever. Yeah. Um, when you have these athletes come out and say like, this happened to me, yeah. um, that's, that's really important. And I can only imagine how hard it would have been for many of them, including the former Chicago Blackhawks player. Like that's those kinds of stories are like yeah. very powerful. Josh, like I've covered also out here the, um, the, the story with the, uh, the former coach who was with the Whitecaps women's team and with Canadian national women's team, both the Olympic team in 2008 and the under 20 World Cup team, who's now um, pleaded guilty to four sex assault charges and uh, is awaiting sentencing. This is in relation to four former soccer players. Uh, it's just a story that's prominent out here and some other ones. And, and, you know, I, I think coaches and I think administrators in sport in high performance sport have to think more about the athlete and the whole person and, and the athlete. I think, think a lot of these situations are, are rise um, because coaches are, it's in such this power position, you know, especially in elite teams where they are the ones deciding who gets on and who gets off. They are the ones sort of setting the tone for the team. Um, and for this one coach in particular, like they let him go in 2008 uh, and he started coaching girls within two months uh, again, this, this, it, and the administrators at Soccer Canada and the Whitecaps, they had some inkling of what was going on, but they didn't do anything to stop this, this mm -hmm. person from getting an, another job almost, almost right away. And it makes me think, and this there's I can there's a bunch of scenarios. The, the ones in artistic swimming are, are are not that horrific, but also similar in terms of there was abuses. And then when it comes push comes to shove, the administrators align with the coach and the athletes are left by themselves and they're in a vulnerable position because if they speak out or make any waves then they're off the team right they're mm -hmm. not going to be seen favorably and so they're right. and even their parents are like that they're weighing uh, uh, you know how do you how do you bring these issues forward without you know jeopardizing your future in this sport mm -hmm. that you've invested so your you and your family have invested so much in mm -hmm. and i think that's the scenario that repeats itself over and over again in canadian sport to to greater and lesser degrees um uh you know the example i gave you is is a terrible one obviously mm -hmm. but but I, you know you you saw that at Bob's Play Canada too mm -hmm. with with the thing that's going on there when when it's the athletes having to figure out how to navigate this system that even though they are at the center of the system they have no way to sort of advocate for themselves without often being punished because it's right. you know yeah so I, th I think safe sport is a great idea it really needs to be a third party it needs to be independent and can't be you can't have sports orgs uh investigating themselves right you just can't right right yeah yeah i mean i yeah it's 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 so prevalent and then the other issue with it is that one person can have such an impact on so many people's lives too so oh, yeah. it it just, you know, this one person who's put in that position and they get it just like the, the gentleman that was with um, the Chicago Blackhawks, he started yeah. working for the national hockey program, like the, the national yeah. team. And then he's working and you're going like, how does this person get opportunity? I've, that's the one yeah. that blows me away is so many of these yeah. people that are clearly terrible people doing horrific mm -hmm. things. You know, there's lots of people that love coaching. <laughs> so why are we giving opportunities to these people that we know are literally committing crimes? Mm -hmm. And then what the impact of this, like how many people did they affect? We don't even know. Mm -hmm. And you look at what it does to the careers, like um, uh, the, the uh, 
Fleury, right? Theo Fleury. Like you look yeah. at what it did to his career and came out and he was a person that was fortunate enough, I guess, in a sense that it didn't affect his contractual, his contractual position with teams where so mm -hmm. many times when people do come out, they literally do get stuffed to the side and they're there yeah. and they sort of disappear. Fleury was such a great player that they, they didn't do that to him fortunately for him and, and it's yeah, great but, that he told that story but yeah yeah but Theo Fleury he was the victim of Graham James right and so of course yeah one of uh, many right. people yeah yeah Sheldon yeah. Kennedy as well and yeah. uh, there's another guy Greg Galulu who recently who talks yeah has become an advocate for safe sport as well right yeah yeah I mean it's 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 yeah it's incredible uh, but those those men have had really hard times in their lives right? Mm -hmm. um, right yeah and the world's a different place now uh victims uh, you know we hear from more victims i think we have language to speak about those things whereas in the past um there wasn't and it was you know no one sort of it, it was all very hush hush all the time right, right. yeah right like I think about my my own kids who are in their in their early twenties, but they you know they could they can talk about stuff. I don't think I could at that age. I don't think I mm -hmm. knew knew the words or knew how to sort of characterize those sorts of things. It was all very very all very kept quiet all the time, right? Right, and it was never, never spoken about openly. Yes, and it, it sort of goes to that victim blaming situation. Yeah. The victims blame themselves and other people blame the victims. How did they put themselves in this situation? Well, it's a yeah. 16 year old kid or a 15 year old kid and a 35 yeah. year old adult. Yeah. That's the person in the wrong, but, yeah. but they feel that way. And then they're so worried. So they, yeah. they stay in these situations longer because of that, like passion for this, this yeah. place they want to get to. Yeah. yeah it's, yeah. And those sexual abuse cases too, it's, it's often as, as you said, and, and these like, I also, I remember asking uh, someone who was involved in the coaching certification in Canada, like, is it written anywhere that coaches shouldn't have relationship, personal relationships with their, with their athletes? Like is, but apparently it wasn't, I think it is now. I think yeah. there's a, you know, but again, that whole thing about not, not being able to talk about or not having the vocabulary to talk about or not being open enough to talk about these things. Right. So everything was always kept hush hush. Um, I, I think we have to just speak very plainly about what the expectations are, especially when you're talking about uh, coaches mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, the power th that they can have and the power position they're in over our athletes, young athletes. Right. 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 Yeah. There's, yeah, there's not only specifics on that, but there's the rule of two now where it's like, there should be yeah. two, two people in the room at any one time. So you're not putting people in those kinds of positions. That's, yeah. those are really, I guess those are the areas where you see that it's mandated growth in a way that at minimum makes it more difficult for people to commit these crimes without a witness. You know, it, it at yeah. least it's, it's forcing like, this is the standard that you have to keep to continue to operate. So I think that's the one area where the growth in that area is inevitable. People have a voice. And while social media is not necessarily always the blessing, uh, sometimes it's a curse, but it does provide a microphone to people, um, no matter your background, that when people do speak out, they do have a platform that they can speak out on. Because in other ways, if somebody of significance doesn't hear of a story, then nobody's hearing them speak. And so I guess that's the, that's one benefit of social media in this era is that while often it's not always used for the greater good, uh, it does give a, it does give a, a microphone or whatever you want to say to, to people when they, when they do have something important to say. Yeah. yeah. Um, I guess the, the next thing I was interested in is like, what, what was there, did you, but was there a passion immediately? Like you were talking about that difficult transition time of going from one sporting life to the other sporting life. Um, was that something you sort of stumbled into or found or felt driven towards that, that you wanted to, to do that? Uh, to get into like journalism and, yeah. and my second, yeah, yeah. So I, I did have a notion that I wanted to stay in sport, but I didn't want to coach. I had a vague notion uh, I'd like to be a sports writer because I had met um, one here who wrote for the Vancouver Sun. Her name is Wendy Long, uh, who was just a, a great sports journalist, uh, covered the Lions beat, covered everything. Mm -hmm. And she, I'd met her because she had done a, a story and I had been interviewed for it. And uh, it sort of started a, a little bit of a friendship. And so that sort of crystallized in my head that maybe I 
could, you know, there, there weren't a lot of female uh, sports reporters back in 1988. Um, Wendy was one of the very few and she was excellent. And she also had a real interest in, in women's sport, female sport. And, uh, you know, when she could, she would report on it. And it was a very rare thing to see female sport covered in your daily paper um, uh, and on the electronic media as well. And, and so that, that, yeah, it sort of sparked my imagination a little bit. And then um, I, I networked as much as I could when I uh, got out of sport and I got a weekend job at CBC in Vancouver as a researcher, which meant pretty much I had to order everyone's dinner and get the order right and then make sure it was delivered after it arrived, you know, mm. at the building on the weekends. And I, yeah, and I, I got to learn actually the, the job, the TV sports reporting job from the ground up because I, I got that sort of foot in the door job. And then, you know, once you, I, I didn't really know what to, I, I didn't know anything. I took some broadcasting courses at BCIT, but I tell you, back then in the late 1980s, so my first job in TV was like in 1980, end of 1988, I started. It's just really exciting, super exciting. Like there's deadlines, there's crazy stuff going on all the time. It's, uh, you know, it's pretty high profile as well. And uh, I, I walked and got a job at the sports office with just a bunch of great guys who were super supportive and uh, very helpful. and patient and you know kind of willing to hold my hand and <laughs> teach me the business uh and so it was a real real lucky sort of blessing for for me yeah and then then because it was cbc it made sense that i would sort of stay on there and try and push because i wanted to do more olympics too i, I have that olympic thing I, I i was always intrigued by that uh, you know it sort of drove my athletic career and it, it sort of drove my broadcasting career as well right yeah, yeah. it's it's like a funny um love affair that many of us often have and it's such iconic moments that have happened that you see and some of those just sear so deeply into your childhood or different times of your life yeah. it's 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 amazing like I will never forget Donovan Bailey's Olympic gold medal run that's one of those moments to me like I remember when that happened in my hometown of uh, maybe it's 3000 people at the time, people, everyone just on the street, opening their doors and just yelling. Like just, <laughs> people were so excited. It was yeah. like new year's Eve banging pots, you know, like yeah. everyone, everyone's watching it. You've never watched the hundred meter before. I don't care. I'm watching this race. And in his particular case, we had this stunning upset, beautiful then horrific moment for Canada with Ben Johnson in 88 so to see that come back in 96 and someone win it and they didn't lose the medal later and set the world record and set the world <laughs> yeah. record when he did it was like yeah. uh so it, it, amazing it, it, and and the other part that I could see that makes a lot of sense is there's something about the roller coaster ride uh that is life but especially athletics is those 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 high points are so brief and it's such a you know, such a hit to your body. And then these low moments are so long, they feel like eternity. And then you get one of those high moments and it feels so deserved, right? They feel yeah. so good. The, those long plateaus or valleys make those peaks feel like Mount Everest every time. So I could see how when you get into the world of broadcasting and there's like, oh, there's this deadline, this thing I have to do. And oh, maybe I have to be on air in five minutes unexpectedly for some trade or whatever that just came up it's like it's you know you get it's such a it's such a high moment or you know we got to call the first ever medal by a canadian woman in judo yeah. and so to feel like you're a little tiny piece of that is amazing like i never it's bring total, it's a total rush right it's yeah, total yeah. Rush. Yeah. so we're sort of like rush junkies and so going into <laughs> yeah. as athletes right and then to go into that for me I feel that same rush when I'm in the chair coaching at a tournament. When I see one of the athletes that I've worked with for 10 years and they win a medal at the national championships, yeah. you feel this personal pride, but you also feel this high for this person that you've known so long. That's That gives me that same, it's the same fix. And then if I'm coaching five athletes, it's even more so you have these highs and lows in the same day. You feel so bad because someone underperformed. You feel so great that someone oh, did perform. Of course. Yeah. And, and so in in broadcasting and reporting, I can only imagine be the same kind of idea. Yeah, it's probably not that personal as what you've just described. Like, how do you how do you deal with that? <laughs> right. You know that whole thing about life and keeping an even keel. It, people say it in 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 broadcasting all the time. Don't get too high. Don't get too low. You know that that sort of idea of uh, 
you know, emotional management or right. <laughs> arousal management or, right. which is probably good for sanity, but it is right. nice to be able to enjoy the, the good moments. Right. Yeah. It's That's a great, a great concept. concept. Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, one of my favorite is the man in the arena speech by, by Teddy, by Teddy Roosevelt. And mm -hmm. he says his, his point is you never want to live in that gray middle. Life yeah. is about passionately chasing things. It's, yeah. it's not whether you're successful or not. It's, it's this, this, the sweat and the passion and the time you put into it. it's being marred right. with the dirt and blood, and, you know, yeah. that you work for. That's what makes life worth living, not living yeah. in this gray area where every day is monotonous. I'm not it's, sure I necessarily agree. I think it's yeah. really personal dependent what people find, but. Yeah, it's, it's, it's in the effort. It's in the trying. Um, mm -hmm. so, so if I were a Pierre de Coubertin expert, like Scott Russell, our colleague, um, right. who, who knows, and that's pretty much the foundation of, of the Olympics, actually, I, even though there's medals and we all focus on that. It is, and, and, and I can't remember the, the quote, but for de Coubertin, it was to to try, right? It was mm -hmm. to participate. It was to be a part of this. It was to join in and, and give it your best shot and, you know, mm -hmm. see how, how much you could achieve, you know, within the crucibles of the Olympics or the sport. But it, it was in the trying and the effort where the, the nobility uh, uh, is found. Right. right. Yeah. And the, uh, the other thing that I love that I'm sure you must helps keep your keeps you passionate and engaged in your job is the one thing that I always find is if you meet an Olympic athlete or you talk to an Olympic athlete or, or a national competitor of anyone, it doesn't matter who they are. Every story is so unique. And that I find I love, you know, it's the same with like musical arts, anyone that succeeds, it doesn't matter who you are. Everyone's story has a unique layer to it. That's very interesting. Um, so uh, another colleague of ours, um, that was the Beijing Olympic champion. She commentated again. My my brain is going off the rails. Uh, what sport? Pardon me. What sport? Wrestling. You called her Carol. Olympic gold medal. Carol Wynn. Yeah, Carol Wynn. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's like every one of these stories that you hear, be, people being highly successful or pushing for those high levels of success. Every story is so unique and so magnetic. Like yeah. it's just so incredible. So that's that's one thing that I think I like that I really appreciate when you hear these stories, you know, and I'm a big baseball fan. So you hear the story of Bo Bichette that's so different than the story of Vladimir Guerrero Jr. That's so different from Jose Bautista. And everyone is like this incredible Kevin Gosman has a really interesting one where he became obsessed with pitching um, his split finger fastball, I think. So he, he took video of this one guy that threw it, that he loved. He inverted it. So it made this left-hander look like a righty. He oh, obsessively, obsessively watched the video until he could throw it exactly like that guy threw the ball. Like wow. that's how he became a really great pitcher. It's like, you know, there's yeah. something they did mechanically to be great, or they came from a, an, a place of struggle, or they came from, you know, like Patrick Marlowe's hometowns, like 50 people. Yeah. Um, it's, it's just, I find those, every story can be really fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. I mean, that's the, what makes sports. So, so as a sports reporter, uh, like getting to tell stories, you, you are so right about that. It's such a rich storytelling milieu. And again, I know I mentioned sort of the, you know, take the little crucible, you know, and it's, it's, it's within this, the, the parameters of sometimes it's as simple as you win, you lose, right? You have failure, yeah. success, whatever, but there's so much other stuff going on, right? For right. these people to, to have these stories and to get where they, you know, get to a point where they have profile and, and yeah, and every, and everyone has a story. Everyone has a story. Right. Like, yeah. And, and if you watch basketball, I remember watching the Raptors when Del Curry was on the team. I yeah. he was this incredible shooter and Steph Curry would be in the pregame shooting when he was eight, and nine years yeah. old. And now he's the best three point shooter in the history of the NBA by far. And so this, as a Toronto fan, you also feel like, you know, people often refer to a team as we, you know, it's like you feel this connection to that individual because I went to Raptors games mm -hmm. where he was a little boy mm -hmm. shooting before the mm -hmm. game started. Yeah. And now I see one of the best players that's ever lived. And I remember seeing him as, and you like, it almost feels like you're part of it in some funny way. Mm -hmm. I don't know why that is. I don't know, but, but, yeah. but, but yeah, yeah, it's, it's such a cool feeling. Yeah, that's an interesting one, the the Del Curry, Steph Curry one, nature and nurture. Although he has a brother who's also successful, right? But yep. he's not he's not Steph. Um, Carol Wynn story, her parents were boat people uh, and they were sponsored to come to Canada uh, to a little church in New Hazleton. That's where they 
ended up after being in a refugee camp uh, for for four years, I think. Um, I think her, I can't remember what she said her dad's job, but there was like four kids, tiny little town, uh, probably smaller than the one you grew up in, New Hazleton, but there was a wrestling coach at the high school. And that little town produced a lot of really good national level wrestlers and a lot of females because it was an opportunity for you know sports minded girls or that you know were interested in competing and and you know being sort of physical expression I guess to to do a sport and that was the sport they did and and they became really good and it wasn't the most high profile coach he was just like the guy you talked about who started your uh your club in your hometown right and and uh, yeah it's it's an amazing story i um interviewed clara hughes when she won her first bronze medal in atlanta that was one of my assignments uh in the i think it was in the road race or was it the time trial anyway uh and that was in 1996 and i was a sideline reporter on women's cycling that day and then in 2006 in trino i was a sideline reporter when she won her gold medal (laughs) yeah it, you know, in a different sport, right? Like, right. In, and, and yeah, it's cycling 10 years earlier and 10 years later, there I am on the sidelines, you know, interviewing her about her. At a winter skating, games, her, right? At a winter Olympics. Yeah. Like, also, not only just, at Olympics, but the other Olympics. It is just an sport. incredible story, but there's someone who had a kind of a troubled childhood as well, you know, mm-hmm. drug taking and all sorts, you know, just bad crowd. Maybe, maybe it wasn't mm-hmm. it, so horrific. Maybe, maybe it's sort of normal stuff that kids do in Canada. Right. Uh, uh, yeah, but uh, also a really interesting story, right? Yeah, 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 it's, yeah. it's awesome. I, yeah, I can just, and, and every time, you know, I, I always do that. It's like, uh, I don't watch nearly as much sports as I'd like, just the time frame, which I often work, but I often read, I, li- I love to read about sports. So I'll read the articles on athletes and how they got to that place. And I find it so fascinating to connect and, and learn about what drove them and where they came from and their background like that. Yeah. That's really exciting to me. So I, I, uh, I'm super, um, what's the word I want to say, appreciative of all the time that you gave me today. And, and it was great to reconnect and get to chat again. So thank you very much for that. And, I, and uh, hopefully I, I did an all right job in your role today as, as the reporter slash interviewer. But, but thank you again for the time. And, and I hope we connect again soon. That was just tremendous. Thanks for the invitation, Josh. It was great talking with you. Thank you.